Okay, so maybe we can start slowly while I will continue admitting people in from the waiting room. Uh, welcome everyone, thanks for joining us this evening and warm welcome to our speakers. Uh, Kim Ferster, who in his talk, uh, Uncementing Modernity, will speak about uh, cement, uh, the most widely used material now in construction after, after water or in general and uh, cement's past, present, and the future. Uh, Kim's uh, talk will be followed by a short response by Amerin Ng, together with Gabriel Vergara and Christine Giorgio, both in the audience. Uh, Amerin is a curator of planetary home improvement from just in time to geological time exhibition currently on view at uh, Viper in uh, Prague. And I'm very happy uh, that uh, we have uh, him here today because his research fits very well in the context or in the frame of, of uh, this exhibition. Uh, Kim Ferster is an architecture historian, author, and uh, educator. Since uh, 2019, he's a lecturer in architectural studies uh, at the University uh, in Manchester. And he's also part of the Manchester Architecture Research Group. Uh, based at the, at the university, sorry. Before that, uh, from 2016 to 2018, he was an associate director of research at the Canadian Center of Architecture in Montreal in Canada. In his PhD, which he completed at uh, ETH Zurich, he focused on the now legendary Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies, uh, active in New York uh, from the late 60s until uh, the mid 80s. And he published on this uh, topic widely, and soon he will publish a monograph on the Institute. Uh, Kim's research and teaching deals, especially in the, in the last years, with political, economic, social, cultural, and ecological issues in architecture. And in recent years, mainly with, uh, with environmental energy and material histories, as we will see today, as well as a humanities perspective on cement as critical building material. And I will also introduce Emmeline, of course, who is an architect, uh, cartoonist, and uh, currently an uh, assistant professor of architecture at the Rhode Island School of Design. Emmeline uh, and her work explores architecture as media, as environmental matter, and as the representation of spatial information, and seeks capacities for counter narratives and a non canonical knowledge. So, thanks everyone for joining us again. And Kim, the floor is yours. I will also ask uh, if you can turn off your cameras, everyone, and, and uh, use the mute button so that uh, we won't disturb uh, the speakers. And after the lecture and Emmeline's response, we can open the floor to the Q&A session. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Irina, uh, for the kind introduction and also um, for the very generous invitation um, to present my work here in the context of the exhibition uh, Planetary Home Improvement, um, which um, happens these days in, in Prague. And um, thanks also um, for um, agreeing to um, have this conversation, Emmeline, um, afterwards. I'm very curious to exchange on your exhibition. Um, and thanks for everybody in the audience. There's uh, many familiar uh, faces and, and names of, of friends and colleagues. I'm happy that you joined. So uh, let me just turn on my presentation. Um, So um, obviously I would have loved um, to travel to Prague today um, to, to actually see um, and listen to the exhibition with my own eyes and ears. Um, there's a reverb. So, um, I, I hear myself, I don't know whether that is the recording. Maybe it's better now, so yeah, it's better. So um, at least I was able to, to join the curator's talk the other week. And um, I, I guess I learned a lot um, there in terms of the content, but also the curatorial approach, uh, the multi-layered um, media approach to make uh, materials a topic um, somehow, to look into material cultures of the Anthropocene and the complicity um, of architecture. Um, 
back then I noticed that we share quite a few questions about approaches to material cultures and also to environmental histories, um, the economies, ecologies of the building material industry, um, also positioning architecture um, in relation to it in this large technological system. As Nehran um, commented, uh, then uh, hinted out uh, that encompasses architecture and uh, con construction in this industry as well as the cement industry. Um, but also, uh, there's this common interest in geology as a modern science and um, um, dominant representations of the lithosphere as uh, something to be exploited. Um, so while um, DIY, um, the, the home improvement is not so much my framing here, I, I share um, this interest in addressing the environmental damage um, of building um, on a planetary scale, um, speaking with Anna Tseng of possibility of life in capitalist ruins, in her case, that of an industrialized forestry um, and the politics of um, environmental justice and asking also for responsibilities, which I see uh, with corporations and the government first and foremost, um, and reparations on a global scale. So as Irina has uh, pointed out, um, tonight I will talk about cement and everyday also DIY building material, uh, more precisely um, the cement industry um, and its reciprocal landscapes uh, to give credit to Jane Hutton's work um, of uh, reinforced concrete constructions and dealing with geographies of extraction at the same time. And um, if um, I have understood correctly, cement is missing in the exhibition in this respect. And I hope to contribute my part thus to this issue addressed by the exhibition to an energy and material transition and the possibilities of a change how we build uh, and live um, in the future. So I would like to start with a 50 kilogram cement sack um, of the Holdebank Braun from 1960, which um, I found in the archives of the uh, Museum of Design, more precisely the graphic collection there of the University of the Arts in Zurich. And at first glance, um, this is a rather unusual archival item uh, since the cement sack um, an industrial packaging made out of paper is the packaging for a rather dirty, dusty, everyday product that was used um, and is used in construction sites of all sizes. What uh, probably caused um, the cement sack to, to enter into the archives uh, was probably the design of um, Siegfried Odermatt, a Swiss graphic designer, pioneer of typographic and conceptual design, who at the time worked for the pharmaceutical and petroleum industries, for the building trade and the timber industry, among others. And what possibly also caused it to enter there, besides its graphics, was the role that cement played in the 20th century in Switzerland. Um, at the latest with a national exhibition of 1939 um, for um, nation building um, and building culture as a common standard uh, for the development, the passage and the penetration of the Alps and the overwriting of the Swiss territory with buildings, construction structures made out of concrete as tangible traces. So the cement sack then um, is the starting point um, of my story here, a narrative device to talk about cement, precisely uh, Portland cement that is um, an industrial, um, industrially produced building material and a commodity um, that has been patented in already in the early 1980s, uh, sorry, in the early 1800s. Um, while the cement sack um, itself um, took on a life as a historical actor, cement, on the other hand, to appropriate the German environmental historian Sebastian Haumann, who has worked on the industrial use of limestone in iron production in the 19th century, um, may also be seen as the critical building material that made certain developments possible um, in the first place, but from today's perspective is in a crisis situation. So there's a widespread agreement, as we probably all know, that cements production and use, and this is knowledge which also entered into uh, the architectural humanities 
uh, due to its high uh, carbon dioxide emission of 5 to 8% globally, depending on the calculations, and the uh, associated environmental damage uh, should be drastically reduced reused, recycled as a building material, avoided as much as possible and ideally replaced. So in my research and teaching, um, which includes aspects of environmental energy and material history of architecture, I work on cement, um, the cement works and the cement regime um, on the example among others um, of the Swiss multinational Holzen since 2001, successor of Holderbank and uh, since the merger um, of 2015 with its French competitor Lafarge world market leader in terms of architectural, technological and material, um, also economic, ecological and geological issues to observe, recognize and name, for example, the path dependencies related to concrete um, in the wake of a globalized economy, um, affecting environment and society alike. Uh, which um, accelerated uh, with the spread and implementation of new ways of thinking in the era of uh, neoliberalism in the 1990s and continued unchanged to this day. Also to understand whether and to what extent other alternative material and energy cultures are conceivable without reducing them to purely economic or even ecological aspects. Um, and which, possibly, which possibilities of action regarding material and energy futures, uh, powerful economic and political actors, for example, large uh, corporations, as well as state governments, but also architecture, urban planning and spatial planning have it all under capitalist conditions. So by means of the cement sack, it is possible to tell, first of all, how during the 20th century, the production, trade, and consumption of cement as a cheap mass-produced building material using cheap nature, cheap energy, and cheap labor, in the words of Jason Moore, um, became globally established, um, even naturalized, um, that is uh, common sense, um, if not concealed. Cement as an industrially produced commodity or also a commodified resource, that of rock strata, um, was thereby subjected to social technical activities in the interplay with cultural discursive activities, not only industries and markets, but also patents and regulations, as well as institutions and cultures which were the basis for the development of um, the cement industry. And this has been in the past covered by architectural historians uh, from different angles. The turning point here was once again, the great acceleration, as you can see from this uh, graph on the cement production and distribution um, of Holderbank uh, since World War II, increased production, consumption and mobility and in architectural and urban terms, this suburbanity combined with automobility, a phenomenon that the Swiss environmental historian Christian Pfister has described as the 1950s syndrome, um, evidenced by increased energy and I would add here material consumption, um, that of cement also. And here, um, possibly the um, socialist countries of the East are perhaps not so different from the welfare states um, um, of, um, of the West. Try to see my cursor, here it is. In the post-war years of the economic miracle, uh, two dominants then intermingle, that of petromodernism and petroculture as elaborated um, by uh, the energy humanities. And uh, I see Jordan Kanga in, in the audience. Um, there have been many working on this in the past. And um, I would add uh, that also of cement modernism and cement culture here um, that intertwine and interrelate uh, all the way through. Until the end of the 1940s, um, as a look at the company history of Holderbank, uh, specially prepared for its uh, 75th anniversary, shows the cement sack was the packaging unit for cement. Um, for the domestic market, uh, cement was sold in bulk uh, with uh, an increase to 3,000 tons kiln capacity per day and uh, was sold as sack cement, um, the majority transported by rail 
and by truck. Um, for this purpose, roads and bridges were expanded um, at the time, while new cement works continue to offer a lane for um, sect cement uh, that is collection directly from the plant by car without intermediaries. And I think this is the DIY moment um, of it. So using the cement sack as an example, however, um, it is also possible to tell a global history of cement. Uh, with the increasing globalization of the building material industry in the post-war period, since new markets opened up first in the global south in Latin America, then from the 1990s in Eastern Europe, as well as in Asia, and in recent years in the Middle East and Africa, where in contrast to the global north, um, there the concrete mixer has become the unit um, of sales. Cement sacks continue to be used as the um, prevalent uh, packaging size, uh, to put it bluntly. Uh, the cement industry investing in the development of uh, DIY chain stores. Today in the uh, debates about the Anthropocene, um, or rather the Capitalocene, that is the new Earth Age in which uh, not just humankind, but especially those with power and capital uh, became the old dominant geological factor, um, concrete, which is a mixer, a mixture of course of cement, water and aggregates, uh, gravel and sand, and the latter by now is in a short supply. Um, so concrete is discussed as the stratigraphic marker par excellence, um, as recently done in an Anthropocene working group um, at the HKW in Berlin. Uh, since the building material is the only one traceable as a material sediment anywhere in the world, as opposed to more volatile ephemeral matter, um, uh, that is only part of the story. While well, there's an awareness of the wider environmental impact, um, not only through building, through the construction and through civil engineering, but more generally through urban sprawl and the sealing of surfaces, for example, concrete um, is the most consumed building material, um, as uh, Irina has already pointed out, and the second most abundant used substance in the world after water. So from the perspective of um, cultural studies and the humanities as um, literary scholars Eva Horn and Hannes Bergthaler demonstrate in their uh, highly readable introduction to the Anthropocene, we are faced with this double task, um, a double rethinking today. Um, one is from a historical perspective to reset or restart um, the history of uh, modernity and hence the title of this talk. Um, and then uh, the second from an epistemological perspective um, to place ourselves in the world again, to establish a quite different uh, kind of relationship to nature, uh, to the environment and to living beings, including humans. So the cement sack then can also help us to explore the episteme of the global as well as the planetary um, that are of course intertwined in relation to cement, which uh, following an essay titled The Global Situation by environmental anthropologist Anna Singh and her approach to writing a quite different history of globalization concomitant with uh, global warming includes world building flows, not only of material and energy, uh, but especially of investments and communication processes that produce globality uh, shaped not only uh, by units but by regions, scales, and landscapes. A global history of cement um, that will follow also um, German historian Sven Beckert's prototypical commodity history in, laid out in Empire of Cotton, uh, that of industrialization, um, colonialism, and imperialism um, as um, the concern um, to, to render the conceptual world ecology approach by Jason Moore more dynamic would consequently focus on the spatial expansions of um, the 20th century cement regime, uh, classically linked to themes of property and labor, um, also in the building material industry, on the shifting of its commodity frontiers over the course of the 20th century. This is a focus um, on the technological as much as spatial fixes, uh, product innovations and new markets, as well as manipulations through communication, through discourses of um, inevitability, inevitability and then that of uh, durability as well. Um, 
a classical theme uh, if it comes to concrete and the frictions related to ecologies and habitats. Despite um, the long-term atmospheric uh, lifespan of carbon dioxide though, our dependence on cement and ways out of it, um, unlike petroleum, is hardly an issue yet, um, as much as questions of environmental justice related to it. In environmental history terms, the difference with other uh, modern building materials, such as steel, glass, and plastic, as uh, Mark Jasenbeck has uh, pointed out in an EFLUX article, uh, due to the great abundance of limestone worldwide and the relatively high transportation costs, um, the quarry and the kiln uh, forming a unit fueled by uh, internationally traded fuels for a long time, uh, coal, then oil, and meanwhile coal again, even lignite, um, then regionally distributed and consumed, um, but at the end of the fiscal year, sales are here calculated um, on a national basis while corporation profits are generated globally. So this is the difference uh, to, to other building materials. So with regard to a material focus, I would now like to present um, three different stories in a, a methodological three-step reflections on a global history of cement that um, address contemporary challenges by um, exemplarily considering three different sides um, at different scales um, um, in relation to the past, the present, and um, the future um, of cement, if there is one. Um, one is a um, historical critical narrative of the kiln um, in the modern cement works, um, which um, reveals the benefits and risks of um, the industrial processes underlying um, an extractive architectural understanding. Um, then second is an architectural critique of a current pilot and demonstration project, which articulates the problems and possibilities for action identified by officials in relation to contemporary urbanization processes. And three then um, is a future prospect of the reclaimed quarry that illustrates the existing practice of ecological uh, restoration in the local context, in addition to suggesting also possible avenues for future design and politics. So first, I start with the kiln. Within the scope of contemporary architectural humanities, the modern cement industry, um, from the perspective of science and technology studies, uh, could be seen as a large technological system, in the words of Thomas Hughes, guided by the interest of a great number of stakeholders. The focal point here is the kiln in the cement works. Um, um, a paradigmatic example for historicizing and at the same time also theorizing buildings and constructions contribution to the Anthropocene precisely because of its central role and cementing the ideas, the practices and institutions of modernity, which requires a critical history of uh, modern architecture combined with an industrial respectively economic history. If you were to adopt an elementary perspective, um, following a new materialism, the kiln, which is a Promethean by nature, may be considered um, an actor in its own right. In this, the cement regime, not least because of the combustion of fossil fuels and the unavoidable emission um, of carbon dioxide, runs counter to any kind of um, solarity that is a fundamental uh, social and cultural realignment with the sun accompanied uh, by politics uh, um, uh, appropriate to the solar age. Um, so this is uh, somehow building upon an essay which I've been uh, writing for an anthology. Uh, this focuses on um, like cultural and social aspects of so solarity to come that um, like was started um, as a debate um, um, by a group um, that uh, started as an after oil um, school in Canada and um, entered through workshops and, and um, also conferences in multiple debates of undoing uh, petroleum. 
the materiality of how we build and uh, live um, must be added um, as a context and complexity, though, um, I argue, to any energy narrative, to um, progressive notions of energy um, transition. Previously, um, the Semenkin has not received much critical attention, neither um, in modern architectural history nor in recent studies of industries of architecture or of the material turn. Um, yet in the 20th century, it became somehow the pivotal site of the Anthropocene, perhaps comparable to the oil refinery, um, as it is currently discussed in cultural and media studies, also the ironworks, the steelworks, the glassworks, or the chemical works. The industrial kiln as some sort of a uh, mega machine of modernity, uh, if one follows Louis Mumford, um, um, is elementary for many building activities. And concrete is one, um, if not the critical building uh, material that has significantly changed and influenced the world in modern times. For the kiln and the cement works, uh, what architectural historian Irene Forty recently pointed out with respect to the myths about the origins of concrete in different national contexts remains true. Uh, that industrial production, scientific knowledge, uh, technological development, architectural urban planning and infrastructural design, as well as uh, financial interest, et cetera, are all intertwined there. So the concrete case study uh, for the developments regarding the global cement industry, which is uh, examined here, based on archival work, not so much in terms of an elite history as it has been often done in, in um, historiography, but rather in a global history against the background of a of a um, history of technology and science is the Argau Portland Cement Works in Holderbank, Canton Argau in Switzerland, that is the place of origin of um, Holzim, uh, founded in 1912 and equipped as a turnkey factory with machines from the traditional German machine manufacturer, Polisius from Dessau. Holderbank uh, was not the first modern cement works in Switzerland and by far not the modern cement works um, in Europe or in North America and also entered um, a saturated market but was able to secure uh, more shares as a result um, of cartelization and uh, benefited from its geographic expansion after the establishment of a financial holding company. And in the context of an environmental history of architecture, um, as outlined, for example, by environmental historian William Cronin, for a better understanding of ecosystems, the reciprocities of the landscapes of extraction, production and trade, as well as construction, it is crucial that the kiln as a cutting edge plant consistently produced high quality 24 seven, and thus made possible in the first place, what is understood um, from a new cultural, um, geographical perspective um, um, and urban and spatial theory as 20th century industrialization, modernization and urbanization. What was decisive from a material point of view, both a vitalist and a historical one seems the organization of all the processes around the kill. The interplay of conveyor belts, coarse crushers, a drying plant, a coal mill, a clinker hall, a cement mill, warehouses, and packing plants, as revealed by schematic drawings, shards, and diagrams, uh, driven by entrepreneurial spirit and business interests, and executed by locally based labor, embedded in regional as well as national geographies, enabled by connections to rail and road networks, uh, supplied with fossil fuels by an uninterrupted supply and fueled by uh, first hydroelectric and later nuclear power, sustained uh, by the progress of modern science and geological knowledge of local stratigraphy in the service of resource extraction and capitalized by distribution to nearby markets easily accessible by rail and truck and finally materialized by the works of experimental architects and engineers at various scales as much as by self builders. While the kiln in all its activity not only generated a wide variety of uses um, that is for buildings and structures 
it also fueled the development of a global market from the very beginning. And within the new world ecology, the cement industry has also relied on a certain arrangement of the world that took shape beginning of the 20th century um, and inherited that of the industrialization of the 19th century. The Polisius iron foundry and engineering works, for example, which presented its uh, grinding mills first at the World Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 19, 1893 to the global market, uh, starting to manufacture and sell complete plants from 1904 onwards, dominated then the European market uh, for a certain time, uh, but also supplied cement plants early on to Egypt and China, for example. History shows that capital expenditures, investments, and disinvestments have always depended on where and how many kilns and quarries um, were operated. And as a core element of the modern cement industry, the kiln, while representing the abandonment uh, or also a supplementation of natural solar building materials and surpassing them uh, with an increasing capacity um, of the constructive volume, according to Vaslav Smil, a Canadian environmental science and political uh, policy scholar of Czech origin, um, otherwise remained almost untouched, unchanged, and unchallenged. The kiln, and in terms of an architectural uh, humanities of the Anthropocene, this is uh, significant, is not only an instrument of industrialized cement production, but also a trope of modernity. It was and still is associated with all the fantasies, the hopes and myths and promises of industrial capitalism, not unlike those of um, state socialism, which is, however, um, history. With the onset of the second industrial revolution, the kiln has fundamentally shaped the way we build and live. And if Switzerland, um, as a modern nation, defined itself as a community through the use of concrete, the expansion of railroad lines and concrete roads, the construction of residential and commercial buildings, uh, partly executed as in situ concrete and partly based on prefabricated concrete, the um, intervention in the landscape with the barges and dams and later nuclear power plants, that is the energy landscapes related to the city, um, this cement modernity comparable and connected to petromodernity brought with it its own preconceptions of politics, um, both the social and the cultural. While well, an architectural, industrial, and economic history of cement plants, uh, which themselves became um, uh, a design object um, for architects, allows an environmental focus then on the histories and geographies of building as well as quarrying. Uh, today, in the light of climate change, the kiln disrupts any future oriented notion of an energy material transition, be it entrepreneurial, governmental, or otherwise, uh, such as through the transformation, for example, of building culture. On the other hand, the kiln in the global south promises economic development and technical progress. In all its Anthropocene paradoxes then, the kiln, if we take it as a starting point, allows us to look beyond the deposited modernities of concrete and those that have vanished into thin air and the historical colonialism and imperialism associated with them. As the heart or hearth of an industry, the kiln has had an impact on the various earth systems, at least since the economic miracle, and um, ultimately with neoliberalism by, for example, promoting um, sedimentation and sealing of the pedosphere, accelerating emissions and uh, um, the warming of the troposphere, and thus contributing to the slow violence um, of the climate crisis directly and indirectly. So since the 1990s, alternative fuels then, first of all, waste wood, later all kinds of waste products, um, used tires, but also um, um, animal fat and others um, have been used in the kiln with the argument of sustainability while still emitting carbon dioxide. And ultimately, it is about the competitive advantage uh, to the neighboring countries, uh, but also global. Considering that the global kill network, um, whether in the hands of um, corporate or state capitalism, um, 
has since become a real problem and that the optimization of the manufacturing process through technical solutions, a digitization of production and construction only meant in the first place and consolidation of the cement vision and the continuation of a business as usual in building and construction, a departure from this in various ways in terms of alternative materials, alternative technologies and alternative processes is therefore um, also thought, represented, and communicated as part of the solution. But the cement industry claims to be sustainable and has high hopes for chemical innovations, a reduction in the proportion of clinker, or in the addition of industrial wastes. Um, and think tanks, on the other hand, produce visions of the future of climate neutral industries. The calculations uh, does, uh, does not add up. This is because the processing of the rock, uh, calcination, even on an industrial scale, is problematic. And the capture and storage of carbon dioxide on the ground or in the seabed uh, is currently still too capital and energy intensive to be used to the extent required in the short time that remains. So in view of the increasing volume of concrete portage here and the, the enormous task of um, urgently um, um, that urgently need to be accomplished, the architectural humanities uh, following debates about petromodernism and petroculture and the environmental and especially energy humanity should start rethinking the kiln, regardless of whether it is operated competitively or collectively, if not fundamentally rethink what kind of relationship to the world we want to and actually can afford to have in the future. An architectural theory and history that seeks, sees the kiln in a planetary perspective, incorporates a political economy, a political ecology, and also political geology of um, cement modernity, and would, um, by addressing not only resource supply and commodity chains, but global value chains, thus differentiate and above all contextualize and thus complicate its object and its approach. On the one hand, also in terms of objectivity and transparency, such as a strengthening against appropriation, it is about a better understanding of the ways of thinking, representing and communicating associated with concrete. And on the other hand, against the backdrop of um, uh, historical responsibility in relation to environment and society, it is about a possible policy by articulating the inequalities associated with purely technological solutions, for example, and path dependencies, thus counteracting the impact on and exploitation of people and planet, which um, I uh, would guess must be at the heart of any solarity uh, for a planetary collective survival. So the second um, narrative then um, enters more into the present and the um, political and demonstration project um, that has entered um, into, into the media. Since another task um, of the architectural humanities in addition to revising or uncementing the historical narrative of, of modernity would be to review architecture's current relationship to the world and its capacity uh, to develop credible visions of the future. The second example of imaginaries of how to try and influence existing energy and material cycles in building and operation today in times of uh, changing climates, um, then is the next uh, short for next evolution in sustainable building technology, a pilot and demonstration project in Zurich uh, that is paradigmatic at once of contemporary cultures of sustainability and of prevailing narratives of the future regarding building materials, building technologies and building processes. The NEST um, opened in uh, 2016 on the initiative of EMPA, uh, that is the Swiss Federal Laboratories for Material Testing and Research on its late modern science campus in Zurich Dibbendorf um, on the outskirts um, of the metropolis on behalf of the ETH though, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology does and thus, um, the Swiss government represents a reorientation of science and research at the beginning of the 20th, uh, 21st century. As a pilot and demonstration project, the NEST, since it started operation shortly after the UN Climate Summit COP21, was committed um, to the climate goals of the 
Paris Agreement from the very beginning, realized as an iconic building without a uniform climate envelope, according to a design by the uh, Zurich office of Grammatikola, um, the nest reveals the interaction um, and interconnection um, between university, industry, and admission uh, from the point of view of science and technology studies, institutional and discourse analysis in combination with qualitative um, methods of anthropology and um, ethnography. It is essential, for example, for architectural humanities of the Anthropocene that the nest as a kind of laboratory and office building has no less a name than to test the future of building um, as it claims, and thus to guarantee building in the future in the first place. For Empa's declared aim as it is evident uh, from public relations documents and was highlighted also in conversations with the protagonist P Peter Rechner, the vice president of EMPER as the initiator and Fabio Gramazio and Matthias Kohler as architects. Um, it is to use the nest as an um, incubator to bring research practice and industry closer together and thus to accelerate the market introduction of innovation here. But the neoliberal state has always relied on free market solutions. The question arises as to whether an energy and material transition can be achieved in this way though. What makes the nest interesting in terms of research design, testing, promotion, sale um, of approaches, ideas, concepts for sustainability and resource efficiency, architecture and technology is then, uh, that it is built as an infrastructure, equipped with the latest technology, um, diverse building um, systems of energy and water cycles overlap here um, at the building level um, as an alternative and in, in addition to existing infrastructural urban ecologies. Also, the nest is conceived as a platform building, literally and figuratively, allowing universities to plug in and out research units, each dedicated to a theme such as renewable energy, natural materials, smart workplaces, sustainable fitness and wellness, um, also digital fabrication and circular building, etc. So from an architectural history perspective, the design foundation provided by the pilot and demonstration project can certainly be compared to John Harbrocken's support and infill concept uh, from the early 1960s. The architects, um, on the other hand, refer to the 1960s references uh, to other 1960s references, including the Japanese metabolist uh, or archigrams plug-in city, painting a rather optimistic techno-utopian picture of the future. And their renderings accordingly show the nest as a permanent construction site. Although the nest is not a laboratory in the classical sense, Empa would like to see individual units very much in the spirit of contemporary laboratory studies as variants of a living lab, um, as model and showcase projects with users as guinea pigs for monitoring and reports. A lot circulates here. Um, besides energy and water, also knowledge and capital and material. The nest is thus an institutional concept, a scientific approach and an economic model at once, which um, here is implemented in an architectural form. Exemplary are the two units that were shown beginning um, of 2020 before the coronavirus pandemic as part of a public tour, the subject of my uh, field research and uh, which is also subject of an upcoming essay for EFLUX and which with um, um, digitization and circularity addresses two of the bigger issues of our times. Um, the DFAP house um, 2000, of 2019, also by Grammatikola, uh, which is short for digital fabrication, and uh, Yuma from 2018 um, by um, 
Jana Zobek, together with Dirk Cable and Felix Heisel, short for Urban Mining and Recycling, show how digital and circular uh, building might look like in the future to appeal to potential builders and developers, rene renegotiating the relationship between aesthetics and materiality, economy and ecology. From an architectural, sociological, economic, and ecological perspective, uh, it would be tantamount to a small uh, revolution of beat under capitalist conditions. If what is being tested and presented here with these two units um, of the pilot and demonstration project were to become um, truly mainstream. On the one hand, in the case of the DFAP house, a readjustment of the Swiss, of, if not the globalized construction labor market about a century after the market penetration of industrially produced reinforced concrete and the reorganization of the construction site according to a co coordinated time logic. Uh, furthermore, the introduction of a new man-machine relationship in construction through the pooling of technological know-how, governmental research funding and entrepreneurial support. And on the other hand, in the case of Yuma, a new kind of sustainable building uh, based on reuse, even more than on recycling of all materials, um, starting um, um, from the uh, premise of um, active design and ultimately um, decoupling of resource supply and value chains with con consequences for design um, uh, now thought of uh, from the end of the life cycle, the profession and the self-conception of architects. In terms of construction, however, the nest is based um, um, on an elaborate reinforced concrete uh, structure designed specifically for this purpose, uh, which runs counter to any aspiration to transform um, building uh, fundamentally as it remains unquestioned as a new structure. It is a precious carcass building in the end. The architects here speak of the backbone, which is pushed into the background by the focus on research and development, and is even invisible in its gray, even though uh, the cantilevered concrete force labs bear witness to it, and uh, finally also remains largely unmentioned in the press coverage uh, since. It is noteworthy that um, Holz in Switzerland um, and not um, that Holz in Switzerland um, has donated um, the material, uh, not in con considerable share of the construction cost. And obviously, it is not recycled concrete, a new product in, in the palette of uh, the cement industry, which would itself um, use concrete though, uh, cement, though. While all sponsors are listed in the entrance hall next to the reception. Uh, where one would actually um, expect reference to the uh, floor occupancy, the uh, globally active multinational corporation advertises the pilot and demonstration project on its website, which testifies to the fact um, that um, it can easily be instrumentalized um, for the communication of um, the cement industry. Still. So the situation becomes more complicated if one considers that there is a monetary station right next to the nest. Um, research has revealed that uh, AMPA has been a member of the Global Atmospheric Watch, an um, international network of research institutions concerned about changes in the composition of the atmosphere since the 1990s. AMPA therefore has a major responsibility at the interface of research, practice, and industry um, of the state and the market with regard to um, the high proportion of global emissions and wastes um, caused by the building material and construction industries. EMPA reports, however, show that it understands quite well that concrete will continue to be in, uh, dispensable in the future, if only for the preservation of the existing structures and buildings that we have, uh, not to mention um, the uh, cement industry supposed noble gesture of merely supplying um, the material for the housing needs of a growing society. Whether the nest is suitable as a model for future urbanization or merely reflects the uh, current policy 
and the uh, economics of redensification um, in the city center, as well as on its periphery, or whether entirely different forms of building and living and of urban renewal must be developed in the interplay of housing demands and housing needs uh, remains to be seen. And on the other hand, AMPA supports research on the global warming potential, for example, of single and multifamily houses made out of concrete compared to those made out of timber as a material alternative for new construction. So to counter the climate crisis, a start would uh, be made if we fundamentally acknowledge our dependence on concrete, um, as we have already done with oil, um, instead of cementing the myth of uh, indispensability, perpetuating existing power relations from a global perspective and reproducing social inequality. While the environmental um, Humanities perspective uh, argues that uh, digitization do does not necessarily contribute to climate neutrality. Um, the th theory of a circular economy understands the primary goal should be to reduce the volume of cons uh, construction and in instead rely on reuse, restoration, and retrofitting. And the last added unit to the nest then sprint uh, from 2021 by NZ2, a Basel based office. Um, is quite uh, revealing in this regard as far as the development of new strategies of recycling of whole buildings of architectural elements and not just of architectural materials is concerned. In view of the technological deepening um, that of industry 4.0 an expansion of the production portfolio and shifting of uh, product boundaries, that of green cement, um, obviously a new highly profitable um, business field. The nest, on the other hand, uh, possibly shows uh, possibilities of, um, uh, shows a way out of the material impasse of modernity and possibilities of a decoupling of CO2 emissions, resource consumption, and social progress towards a circular building in a circular society, uh, which is a fundamental question um, to be raised. The key point, if we do not take the climate crisis as a given, but as a man-made and therefore changeable um, um, aspect is not whether, but how quickly an energy and material transition towards the solar and the regenerative could be accomplished in which architecture and also architectural education could play a part. So my last and final uh, part is on the reclaimed um, quarry since a further major challenge for the architectural humanities, in addition to the decarbonization and maybe also associated decolonialization in thought and practice would be to put the nature culture divide into perspective and to reflect upon the relationship um, to, to other uh, beings. Um, when it comes to the landscape changes associated with the production of cement and thus architecture, the quarry in its recultivated form is another example uh, to draw upon um, and to demonstrate a different um, future oriented dealing with the legacy of cement modernity and cement culture and to demand also a responsibility. The quarry whose location, quality and productivity uh, was initially defined by geology and modern science and which uh, was developed um, then by extractive industries in the course of the 20th century refers, first of all, to the exploitation of rock strata, of limestone and marl, and uh, not to mention the exploitation um, of the labor force, uh, which was uh, migrants' labor in the first half of the century in Switzerland to be replaced by um, Swiss laborers afterwards. With an awareness of the Anthropocene that is um, changing our new views of nature, culture, 
um, of humankind and technology and uh, in terms of construction indeed requires to be aware of the entire uh, resource chain, the reclamation of the quarry, a practice that has been gaining momentum since the ecological turn um, of the 1970s appears in a new light, uh, may make us sensitive to the possibilities of planetary care and thus also of collective survival. Um, the quarry in its recultivated form is thus the site and also a think piece um, of the Anthropocene at once. And here too, Holderbank, um, I think, is a um, compelling case study, uh, more precisely the Schumel quarry, which was operated until 1978 and left uh, an open wound in the Aargau landscape for a long time. And this was evidenced early uh, by landscape and also by aerial photography, which uh, made human activities, the deforming and disfiguring perceptible um, in the first place. A historical perspective evidenced by archival records shows how the company uh, enabled by engineering um, successively um, acquired land over decades and was able to convert communal forests um, into mining areas um, and industrial zones and through the intervention had an impact um, on the environment there. From a geological, pers a geographical perspective, the reclaimed quarry thus can be seen as an extreme, um, if commonplace, example of a cultural landscape. And in addition um, to the querying history and the resulting forms and processes and meanings, however, for a better understanding. Um, of and potential for action today, it is revealing what followed then. Um, that is uh, the quite conflictual planning history of a recultivation, which started in 1979 and was realized in several stages from 1984 onwards. So this development did not imply that the company um, now hold up on cement and beton stopped carrying. Um, on the contrary, um, because at the same time before the oil crisis of 1973, it had already taken over other sites in the canton of Argo and expanded capacities where it built advanced cement plants, state of the art in its sense, and a technological solution, technological fix to expand the cement regime, which took on a different dynamic with the collapse then of the market due um, to the rising energy and cement price trends. With the closure of the Schumel quarry and the relocation of production landscape architects Peter Stadli and Dieter Kienas, uh, based in Wetting in Argo, so not far away, and the third partner of um, the office, SKK, um, who was then responsible actually for the execution during the project, became Hans Dietmar Köppel, uh, were commissioned with the recultivation planning, which initially foresaw a recultivation. Um, no, sorry, a reforestation. And they brought with them expertise in dealing um, with uh, reclaiming gravel pits as much as a focus on spontaneous vegetation. In the interplay of market and state, design and politics, the Schumel quarry is an example of the conditions and limits under which the new environmental thinking, ecological awareness at the interface of extractive as well as fiscal regimes, political and economic order, a reorientation of Swiss landscape architecture, and as discussed by Adrian Forty and his, in his book, uh, Concrete and Culture, also a brutalist revival in, in Switzerland in the 1990s uh, came into play. And an examination of the quarry as a historical site of the Anthropocene is not only pertinent for a better understanding of the material and energy flows that stand at the origin um, of the construction industry and also construction activity, the way companies as well as municipal and then cantons and the federal government dealt with the wounds reflects the interest to which building with concrete is subject. For a long time here, the fact that um, the extraction of gravel, limestone and marl had inscribed itself into the landscape and even more um, that the territory of Switzerland was defined by advancing urbanization was not an issue in Switzerland. 
landscape destruction become a social and environmental concern only with the advent of nature con uh, conservation. And the so-called mining decree of the Canton um, in 1980, as a result of the federal spatial planning law um, of the previous year called for the recultivation then of mining sites that were no longer in use. The meeting minutes and draft text here show that the cement industry was initially to remain uh, excluded and thus exempt. Ultimately, Haldebank was prepared for the legislative amendment, though, uh, because of the very drafting of the plans by SKK. The commissioning of SKK by the company happened only after the recultivation had finally been approved by the municipality in 18, uh, 1985 after some back and forth and the planning and implementation of appropriate measures, a departure from pure reforestation as planned and a turn towards landscape architecture um, that takes ecological cycles into account was a lengthy pro process based on uh, the preparation of expert reports on flora and fauna that had meanwhile returned to the site. Archival documents here show that the preservation of the former quarry in its morphological form with its climatological peculiarities as a skirt, so to speak, was argued for by both its biological, but also by its ge geological value for the local ecosystems. And the backfilling was almost impossible due to the required volume of stones and soils. The focus was now on botanical and zoological uh, variable areas, which promised not only natural, but also recre recreational and educational value, although it was initially left open whether further, further querying would take place. So one of the landscape architect's principles was to preserve and incorporate the rural vegetation that is species and biotic communities that grow on rubble or similar subsoil and had already developed here as a third nature of the quarry, so to speak. Interventions were only planned in a few places, for example, by careful slope stabilization or targeted planting. The design plans testify to the fact that the Schumer quarry only uh, regained its agentiality with its closure after decades of exploitation of first nature and the creation of a second nature. Since the project's completion, guided tours have been offered regularly, providing new narratives about the shaping of ecological assemblages, plant and animal relationships. Locally, however, the decisive factor was that part of the former quarry was to be reclaimed for the village as a new center. For this purpose, the bottom was refilled with excavated material from the vicinity and converted into um, a building zone. What was built, though, was not the public buildings as stated in the zoning plan. Um, only housing with a recalled quarry as a, a microcosm as hand, at hand. The landscape design, as well as um, political handling of the quarry, a new concept of the environment was invented then. For care and maintenance, a nonprofit foundation was established in 1998 uh, after the completion of the second stage, generously, generously subsidized by the company. And activities were subsequently communicated through the public uh, authorities and the press, for example, through the production of brochures and the organization of public days. The Schumel Naturstiftung was a public private partnership with which the cement industry um, proposed to care for the habitats in the former quarry. The P PR department of Holderbank Cement and Beton wasn't uh, responsible for the communication. Obviously, there was a need and also a budget. And if environmental protection and corporate publicity, uh, some might refer to this as greenwashing, have historically had a long relationship. Um, the Swiss federal government and the cement industry since the 1980s have been involved in reinventing and communicating what from then on was understood as the environment here. 
that acquiring was made politically communicable in this way. And in the end, the federal government paid for the uh, sustainment measures. So ultimately, the recultivation effort, despite or precisely because the associated promise to you, if not to reverse, then at least to mitigate the human impact on ecosystems, did nothing to change the industrial production and economic practices of the cement industry. This is because the mining decree, which existed until 2000, also stipulated that a permit for the opening or expansion of a quarry would not be issued until a follow-up plan was in place. With exploitation of further quarries, uh, Musital in Racking up north and Gavenkopf in Singental uh, just to the east of Holderbank, and the um, increasing production of cement Conservation was now expected um, to play um, a mediating role for the continuation of querying in the name of the requests um, of the quest uh, of profit that goes hand in hand with urbanization and modernization. Escarcar had planned recultivation um, uh, for these queries, which made further mining in stages possible in the first place. And stages of exploitation were advanced in parallel with those of restoration. Terracing was used to create a kind of terraforming with an ecological phase, and deep cuts were hidden by leaving ridges standing. So um, to conclude, the spatial planning in Switzerland provides planning aids um, today to ensure access to our supply of primary uh, raw materials for cement production beyond 2024. And meanwhile, in the context of the demand for transformation of construction, indeed a non-extractive architectural stance, the quarry has become a field of a regional conflict, expansions and redevelopments are the scene of frictions and struggles, negotiations and compromises that shed light on notions of um, environment and society and how they interplay today. For the architectural humanities, which historicize and theorize the cultural landscapes with recourse to a political um, ecology or even a political geology with regard to collective survival, it would be too short-sighted if it were content uh, with small scale geologizing or even ecologizing on the ground. And instead it would rather um, have to be about socializing and politicizing the Anthropocene with regard to the regional and the global, indeed a multi-scalar endeavor, including the planetary scale. And in this sense, in the face of an increasing global cement industry with um, economic activities abroad, um, uh, can the um, recultivated curry then be used, um, I would like to ask, as an analogy to the scalability of business models, to think about the scalability of international policy and design of ecological restoration, um, if not reparation. So the recultivation history of the Schumel quarry, and this is how I would like to close, may therefore also be understood as a parable for uh, the future uh, design of ecological assemblages uh, beyond the mesocosm in relation to the macrocosm of the pedosphere, uh, where all life takes place. For the recultivated quarry also represents an archive of possibilities of new forms of governance and their representations, but also for everyday practices of care and maintenance. If today in the Schumel quarry, the globe uh, skimmer, a wandering dragonfly from Africa, which needs an isotherm of 20 degrees Celsius to survive has settled, one of the few places in Europe so far, this says something not only about the warming climates and the migration of critters, but maybe also about the success um, of the ecological restoration. And knowing that the historical responsibility um, of um, the cement industry for carbon dioxide emission and other related environmental uh, um, damages and knowing that these will um, take effect on a planetary scale and over a long period of time, the question might be whether findings and lessons on recultivation can be applied to those uh, systems that are already damaged, diminished or destroyed often beyond our perception. 
The reclaimed query may well uh, serve as a frame of reference after gene engineering. Um, in the words of Holly Bagjean, for example, through technology-based versus nature-based approaches to carbon rem removal through carbon capture and storage, a reference for care and maintenance of the changing atmosphere where it overlaps then with the hydrosphere and the lithosphere, the soil layers and the hydrological cycles impacted by sedimentation and sealing. Since um, it is not done without a one-off design in this case. Um, so thank you um, for your attention. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Kim, so much for uh, such a multi-scalar um, material history. I think I learned so much. I mean, looking back at our exhibition's um, cement uh, profile, I think there's a lot to, to add to that now. Um, I might uh, begin just with a few markers for conversation um, uh, on your presentation, and then we can kind of get into any questions from the audience and also from uh, our, generated from our conversation. So um, I really appreciated that you started with the unit, the, the cement sack uh, museolo uh, kind of museologically um, preserved. And it's so funny that it was a flattened bag, uh, it's totally devoid of labor material, uh, the, the mess that we, you know, concrete engenders. And, and I think the, the kind of, um, you know, cement being a preliminary act an establishing act in construction is, is kind of like right after um, excavation of, of the earth um, I think it's a bit of a, you know, way to to think. Even at that, the, the the act of cement is depositing back stone into the ground. But instead of, um, you know, you can never re really return stone to the ground in the same way. Um, it's now kind of, you know, this I, this thinking of the the planetary, the global. It's like upper crust, the topmost stratum of the earth is now kind of crusted over with with cement. And so I I really appreciate then how you unpacked, you know, the kiln as an actor. Um, both on site and off site. So you know, when we think of how cement is processed, at least the industrial narrative, it's usually about the architectures of the plant, um, which you showed in your diagram, process, kiln and so on. But then you go off site to modern energy landscapes um, and you, you start kind of expanding on how it's entangled very much with non-human actors as well. And so I, I wonder also, I might add here the, the scale of the body um, lungs that are filled with dust, that kind of affective dimension. I wonder if that plays in um, to any of the work. And as you know, you mentioned um, uh, cheap nature, Jason Moore's kind of question of labor and, and, um, and body figures into that. Um, I also wondered about your, your, your approach to cement in situ pouring uh, and cement as a prefabricated um, production. So the kind of off-site like tilt-top panels, for example, that are brought on site. And so labor becoming specialized and maybe that figures into a, a broader industrial narrative. Um, uh, and then the Nest demo, which uh, was kind of an institutional DIY I, I found on that other end of the scale. Um, and so, yeah, I was, I was curious to hear about like, you know, how, how else can we rethink this kind of corporate material science? Um, you know, which still retains power relations to the global commodity chain that you so eloquently outlined um, in even in any kind of transition uh, to a greener material or corporate social responsibility or green offsets. Um, what 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 alternative contracts, right, can we start to think of that um, partner with maybe non-human um, entities, rights of nature? Um, I was really struck by, yeah, the last few slides of the repair. Um, when you when you show the map of Holderbank's map of um, of restoration, and I, I really wonder about the the um, the omission of the non-human in these these visualizations, these representations. Uh, the river, for example, is just like a kind of ghosted um, uh, um, outline on the map, which we know that concrete and cement, you know, uh, quarries extract immense amounts of water. So, what happens to that beyond the verdant green hue? Um, of restoration and um, and the edges of the map who's who who lives there what are the penciled in but never really fully identified um, adjacencies 
um, that you mentioned also Robert Nixon's slow violence um, of, 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 you know, um, those living immediately close to uh, anthropocentric activities. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to kind of lay that out on the on the table and, and hear what you, you maybe think about that. Oh, and one more thing I did want to put on there is um, the potentials and limitations of, of the prototype. Um, and this is, again, thinking about nest and also thinking about um, architecture um, proper, so to speak, and, you know, the R&D phase, the kind of the demo in a way, which I think Orit Halpin has talked about as like a change deferred. So we're constantly deferring change in favor of um, testing. And I wonder how productive and um, which it is, you know, there is a significant value in that material testing, um, but how you see um, that through your lens. Thank you um, for the great um, summary and going beyond and addressing all the blind spots that I couldn't cover in this um, already lengthy um, presentation of, of three different stories and um, to, to start um, somehow um, going through some of those blind spots. I mean, I tried to address labor where I could somehow, um, and it's still a story that I uh, would need to tell, um, and there's different um, entry points that I have identified uh, so far. And, um, one, um, I mean, big question is to what extent I will stick to to this place of Holderbank or whether um, I would need to globalize that from the very beginning while it's centered. Of course, it starts with Britain and um, with the research method workshop that I taught. Somehow we started to, to look into another um, parallel development uh, close to Manchester that of Hope Cement Works um, somehow uh, where um, the question of labor came up where it's a different British labor history um, that came out of a strike situation where in Holderbank, uh, as far as I understood, also from the stories that have been told by uh, the municipal officials that I met and went to the quarry to somehow, um, they were talking about um, this rural history uh, of some sorts of um, Switzerland um, at the turn of the century really being in economic decline. And um, so I want you to, to see to what extent the villages that uh, were hosting then the cement industry somehow were part of this. Um, basically, the um, narrative goes that uh, communal land, um, the almond um, was sold, uh, the commons um, to um, make some money to send people off uh, to the Americas. Um, and so somehow there's this transatlantic thing um, that uh, would, on the one hand, free some um, um, whatever need for, for labor to, to employ the others. Um, I don't know when the my, my migrational history of labor started. Um, I mean, this is a common query story, I think, in um, Switzerland, but somehow there's this um, dirty um, job uh, story connected to it. Um, so um, those descriptions I'm very curious about in parallel to the descriptions of the process of the machinery of the architecture. And um, I mean, I found in, in cement industry publications um, almost um, like uh, anthro um, apologizing narratives of comparing the process of the cement kiln to the digestion system of a, of a human being or a being somehow um, written by a bio biologist and uh, I would be curious what are the narratives existing um, uh, talking about the labor, um, there's some, in part, somehow housing stories around it. Um, there's new, like, workers' houses being built. Um, there's also alcoholism stories around it. Um, and uh, eventually there's pollution histories uh, um, that uh, could be told. And um, this pollution history started from the very first year uh, of operation, uh, 1930 in the archives. You could see somehow that um, this dust plague, as it was called, um, that um, I would need to trace whether that has entered into environmental histories of pollution at all, or whether it was always the dark pollution of the coal uh, somehow that prevailed. And uh, I would be curious to look into more um, how those um, the dust plagues were perceived, the last ones um, that I found 
were covered by um, like newsreels in the 1960s and um, like from listening to the the voices of um, the local residents but also um, the industry representatives there uh, somehow they have no conversation going on so it's two different kinds of conversation that happen be it affecting uh, somehow um, I mean, the, the crops on the fields or um, the laundry on the lines um, or the livelihoods um, of, of everybody living there um, compared to the livelihood of the industry somehow. And um, I haven't seen any like air measurements, uh, like any uh, sensing data of some sorts um, that, um, could be seen. This um, should exist for the present, um, where it's a different kind of um, story. I mean, that all combines to this new filtering technique that was introduced in the 1960s that, um, again, was a technical fix to an issue that uh, was in existence for 50 years. But somehow the, uh, the pollution, of course, continued. And uh, one part was the toxins that were higher. Um, like according um, to, to news um, paper um, press coverage, uh, somehow there's uh, both medical protest as much as local and uh, resident protest along those lines uh, that the government, the um, Department for the Environment um, issued higher uh, figures for Swiss um, industries than um, across Europe um, for competitive reasons. And uh, those are stories to, to also to see uh, since the labors were local uh, to see how they are impacted by the very machinery um i hope this right. answers a bit your first question of bringing in the 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 laborers and um, yeah this is uh, certainly um like um as, as a story to research and to tell um i still would need to see where to go whether this forms into a larger book project or like what kinds of um, yeah, other researchers might pull this. Um, I started to research the state archives in Switzerland, um, in Canton Argo, and uh, the information is limited on those issues. So um, there's next steps to be done. Yeah, no, that, that's an incredible response. And I, I, I was just really taken aback by your detail, which you said was a, um, a common quarry story, which, you know, the, the migration aspects of, of extraction, and I never really considered that like the literal displacement um, uh, across countries to 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 mine um, and I wonder about those like mineral rights documents or um, in 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 some cities um, there are um, communities living over um, and mineral extraction happening under and then this is kind of um, um, asymmetry in site on site and then I and then this is like a complete removal um, to to take over so um, I, I, I think also what was beautiful about your, um, how you ended on the slide of like the care, the maintenance manual, or, or at least the kind of um, photographs trying to document like the emergence of life on a ruined site. Um, and, and I wonder about like um, uh, even who the caretaker of the quarry is like on the ground, who is that, but what, what do they do exactly every day and how how is their narrative uh, material history kind of, um, you know, they, they're, they're at the, e the end of life, so to speak. Um, um, yeah, so I, yeah, kind of curious about those. I, I, I do want to, um, just in, in, in terms of time, I do want to open up the questions as we talk um, to any questions in the audience. Uh, yeah, please do write it down. Um, uh, or if you'd like to, yeah, um, post it in the chat, and then you can also ask your question in um, um, in the Zoom meeting. That'd be great. But yeah, I I think also maybe to um, kind of double down on the question of uh, the planetary, which is perhaps distinct from the global. Um, and I I wonder what that distinction is. Um, uh, in and you know you you mentioned kind of a really kind of interesting, you know, some of some of the ways we think about concrete, uh, the chemical innovations, like as you as you mentioned, you know, cement um, admixtures that can basically make cement more durable, um, more um, conduct, uh, you know, uh, 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 higher strength, more workable, basically to to manipulate for um, construction all around the world. Um, but there's also a kind of elemental kind of um, 
uh, composition question that changes like, the fungibility of the material. It changes how it reacts in the soil. I, I'm not sure if, if um, how, yeah, how do you see the, the planetary, I guess, in, in, in your work? Um, thanks again. Um, great questions. Um, maybe you start with the, those documentaries of the plants, which is the highly local story. And um, yet the question, of course, is um, like, can, can you jump scale in there? Um, can you think the atmosphere is the quarry? And uh, can you th think the soils that are impacted um, somehow? And I mean, this is work uh, also done by others um, to, to a large extent. But um, first of all, I mean, my, my interest was to understand exactly those practices of care and how they can translate. Because in um, academic debates, somehow care, stewardship, are brought thought together, uh, but then it's the painting of the fence and it's it's not the mowing um, and eventually it is local community um, it's volunteers um, uh, currently it's also flocks of sheep um, that mow um, and uh, out of a reason an economic reason but I was curious to see there's this an abundance of those photos because the biologist on the team somehow the brother of one of the owners of Eskaka uh, was taking care of this documentary um, uh, time I mean, which was also uh, kind of commercial because they had to report and 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 prove that work is done, although it's it's long time work, right? And I was interested in that landscape architecture. Of course, things uh, in longer terms um, than um, you would expect in architecture, where life cycles are, are fixed somehow, and obsolescence comes in. And uh, so, landscaping is projecting into the like future to some extent, but also care um, happens um, like at a scale of, of, of whatever, once a year. Um, so cutting, mowing is only done occasionally and uh, plants are cared for and looked for only over a certain period of time. But I think it is important to, 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 to think in those uh, time uh, scales um, in, in terms of what is this planetary care of the atmosphere? How could this look like? Um, I mean, one of the aspects is, of course, that of reforestation programs um, that we would like to believe in, although uh, calculations would show that we can't plant as much as needed uh, for the process. And talk is that, of course, it would need um, somehow the carbon capturing uh, because it accumulates over time. Um, and right. uh, so, uh, um, yeah, I would be very curious to see uh, to what extent could this, this question of, of care and maintenance or stewardship go beyond and also see who's involved, um, but also who pays for it eventually um, and who would be like, would it be possible to hold I mean, the state, um, since this is like the political authority that we speak to, are responsible uh, for caring for our, what are the business models, on the other hand, that the industry invests in um, that uh, commodify carbon um, to some extent. And uh, I mean, there's this spin off in Switzerland also of Climate Works that now has this plant in Iceland um, that um, somehow experiments with new business models around it, where the question is to what extent is. Uh, like the communal thought with it. So, um, and the global community, of course, um, is larger uh, than of any uh, reclamation project. Uh, um, but yet I, I mean, I, I would like to uh, learn more, first of all, about landscape architecture and the rural um, in this sense, um, like how to support what what grows um, even in the sites of, of ruination, um, as much as seeing to what extent um, yeah, the global industries um, that are um, expanding. And um, I mean, the new frontier is that of green cement that should be not only used by architects, um, if we believe um, representatives of the industry um, in, like in, in our practices, uh, but also that should be exported. Um, so the markets are the global south. Um, and um, I guess this is the global uh, where the planetary comes in since um, I mean, the, the um, heat and climate somehow affect um, those regions the most. Yeah, no, that's that's fascinating. Like, um, just thinking about um, green concrete and how the, the practice doesn't change, just the 
the the, the um, composition of the material. I, I'm so curious to what extent you know um, we start to think about concrete not just as a, a tabula rasa for new construction, as usually you know as you your picture of the nest project. Um, the slabs upon which um, new construction can can be plugged in and plugged out. What other kind of bases for architecture, like uh, literally, can, uh, are there? Um, and if that, yeah, if that form of practice also, you know, affects how we relate to the earth um, differently. Yeah. Uh, um, were there any questions in the audience? Um, Great. Uh, Gabrielle has a question. Um, Gabrielle, if you did, you want to read out your question, or do you, um, should I should I read it? Sure. Um, it's more or less back to the topic you were talking about care and maintenance. So it's quite simple. So, from your perspective, the responsibility of the industry itself, so beyond local communities and local governments, how would be what should be the role? of the industry, especially then in other and another uh, extraction activities or mining, especially the private industry after they leave these places, you know, with the damage, what do you think uh, the, the role of them in this process of care and maintenance? And thank you for the great presentation. I really enjoy it. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's the, the rele most relevant question, right? Um, would, would industry get away with um, um, like recultivation measures? Um, and um, I mean, there's budget questions and budget has been paid, but it's always a relational issue. And um, I think the budget has been paid for um, eventually a quite local endeavor while um, course the carbon dioxide emission is I mean it's invisible right and we can't perceive it it's the, the hyper object uh, part of the story and so it doesn't become a political concern um, eventually and um, I think we are in this phase that this will uh, translate itself uh, whether and it's it, the market model is successful to some extent and um, I mean this is a, a big question again uh, like what industry would pay for um, like R&D in there. Um, I was joining this discussion in the context of the concrete uh, exhibition that uh, happens these days in Basel at the um, SIM. And last week there was a discussion um, somehow around like industry models of new kinds of constructions uh, that save 85% of cement somehow, but still it's 15% um, in there. And um, I mean, the fuel question is not solved while also somehow the new um, aspects of material changes concern industrial wastes and um, especially this question of 40% uh, used tires, it's a petroleum product that uh, is glued in multiple layers. And so there was this discussion amongst like different voices in there, some critical and others uh, corporate and um, basically, yeah, the, the, the question that was um, like um, raised at the very end is what should this uh, budget for R&D be invested in? Um, is it this, this uh, recycled cement, if you know that it's uh, recycled concrete, that it's aggregate, that it would still need like the glue um, eventually, um, while there's apparently also um, low and medium scale machinery that would separate um, the components of cement. Um, but the question is that of scaling it up as much as with the nest. Um, I mean, this aspect of um, what to invest in and whether that needs to become um, scalable to some extent where the hindrance is with uh, somehow um, reuse um, practices and, and narratives. So um, yeah, maybe this is where responsibilities can be drawn. And the question is, what is the dialogue around it? Um, I would need to understand historical cases, how responsibilities were made. And um, I mean, it was a political decision eventually at a cantonal uh, level. Even. Um, through, um, I mean, a quite aesthetic argument that of landscape, um, 
conventionally. And I'm not sure whether that can be drawn as a parallel for the atmospheric changes that uh, we are witnessing. So I don't know whether I answered this, but maybe it, it shows the, um, the problematic. Um, yeah, I, just to maybe, um, and you know, um, if anyone else has a final question, please do um, post it as we as we wrap up. Um, but I, I I think that the putting pressure on the industry and in, in, in you know, there's one on one hand the corporate C the CSR that that they they pledge to the degree that they want to pledge, and then there's the question of um, and maybe this is also in, in the petroculture, right? Like um, oil spills and who cleans that up and. Um, and quite often, if the risk is so large that it's economically unfeasible for uh, repayment, then it's kind of dissolves into it's the question of risk and, and economics. And somehow that machine needs to be re, rethought some, some like new contractual relations to, to, to the land and to, um, yeah, to each other. Um, Are we, are we nearing the end of time? Well, I think there's, or I see no no other question. So the last call, <laughs> if someone has a question or a comment. Otherwise, thank you everyone for uh, staying with us uh, for, the, for the whole event. Thanks to Kim, thanks to Emeline uh, for uh, such a wonderful, lecture and uh, and discussion and uh, yeah see you next time then thanks Thank thanks you. kim thanks Thank pleasure see you